Point Blank is a crime fiction podcast. It may not be suitable for all listeners. We discuss violence in all its forms. The works we reference may include period slang, which some listeners may find offensive. The hosts also have a tendency to swear. Episode 12, The Maltese Falcon by Dashiell Hammett. Yes, welcome to the podcast. This is part one of our discussion of the Maltese Falcon by Dashiell Hammett. Probably the most classic, perhaps the best known book that we have discussed so far. And and certainly the one that has uh, seeped into popular culture more than more than any other book in our discussion so far. What did what do you like about the Maltese Falcon here, Justin? Why were you excited to put this one on the list? Well, geez, it's a, I mean, it's a classic. And ever since our second episode, when we recorded uh, and focused on Red Harvest by Dashiell Hammett, which was his first novel, I felt like we were doing a disservice to our listeners by neglecting this book. And I was like, don't worry, folks, we're going to get to it. I promise. Episode 12. But episode 12 is really far from episode two. We do this once a month or even longer. So it's taken us a whole year to get back around to this seminal work, this classic piece of hard-boiled fiction. And Part of me is just relieved that we're finally able to focus on it and actually consider it in the context of some of these other works, some lesser, some greater. Does it really stand the test of time? Is it really that seminal piece that should and is rightfully on the pedestal? I mean, this is Dashiell Hammett creating essentially this hard-boiled private detective genre in the way that it's been modeled and emulated by everyone from Chandler to to Lou Archer to all these other folks. So I'm just excited to finally get to it. I think it's a good book. I don't think it's as great a book as some people do, though. Oh, so I'll, I'll admit that. Yeah, I kind of agree with you. But that said, I think it's still a must read to understand this genre. And we'll get into that a little bit more later. But I mean, this is it, folks. It does feel like we've neglected it. But this is this is the book that gives you the the detective sitting at his desk and the and the femme fatale walks in through the door and causes all manner of havoc. Here we go. You know, the the search for the falcon or in the words of Sam Spade, the dingus. So we'll we'll talk about Spade <laughs> and his dingus later on. Yes. Yes, and also the setting. We we're in we're in that foggy San Francisco. You know, you got to watch where you walk. There's alleys. There's shootings in the streets. You know, all that whole vibe. The vibe that what you're looking for in in film noir that that comes out of this book. It sure does. Well, before we get into the details of all that, Justin, uh, anything new? Uh, anything exciting going on? Well. I admittedly am exhausted. Uh, I tend not to reveal the time of the year in these podcasts uh, for our, uh, the sake of our listeners, but I'm a fucking teacher and it's the end of the semester and I'm so glad and summertime looms and it's warmer weather and long nights and I just want to sit on the patio and drink whiskey and like watch birds mate on the wires. That's what I want to do right now and I can't wait. So that's my excitement. It's the excitement of deep exhaustion mixed with hope that I will regenerate. Well, you there's <laughs> you really uh, you can't get much better than watching birds mate on the fence. So I've been thinking uh, about it for months. <laughs> Whatever does it for you, Justin. <laughs> How about you? What, what's going on yes. with you, Captain? Uh, well, I've been pretty busy uh, lately as well. Not as much time in the last uh, last couple of weeks for you know crime fiction and you know movies and whatnot. So I just I haven't don't have a lot to share on that front, other than what we've got for our uh, reviews today. Um, we are recording this uh, on my dad's birthday, so I'm going to wish him a happy birthday over the podcast, even though uh, this will come out much later than his actual birthday. But happy birthday, Dad. Happy birthday, Kurt's dad. Well, and as a present for our listeners, I do want to announce that we're going to have a contest. Woo! Yes. So, and in an effort to uh, get more listeners for the show, what our contest is going to be, you'll be drawing for a $25 gift card to Powell's Books, which uh, not affiliated with us, but they are a damn good bookstore. And the nice thing about Powell's is not only is their selection huge, but it's both new and used books. So you can really find pretty much whatever you want. And to get your name in the drawing for this contest, what we want you to do is we want you to share 
the show on social media. And you can get one entry, you know, for reposting it on your own Facebook page. You can get another entry for sharing it with a group that would be appropriate for the show. You can get an entry for really any kind of social media that you're connected to. Or, hey, if you want to put up posters in your neighborhood, that'll count too. Instagram, Twitter, what what have you. Just take a screenshot or something like that, some sort of proof that you did it, and send that to our email address, pointblanknoir at gmail.com. And for each one of those, you'll get one entry into the contest. This is going to run uh, about two months from the date that this show releases. So when we release the first part of our episode on Nordic Noir and the girl with the dragon tattoo, the contest will be over. Uh, We'll do a drawing um, away from our recording. We'll contact uh, the first person on the list. And if they get back to us in a reasonable amount of time, they'll get their 25 bucks. And if we can't get a hold of them, we'll pull another name. So a nice way to get a book, uh, possibly two books, possibly three or four books. So, or or uh, a dozen or so pens. Yes, a dozen pens. Whatever, whatever, uh, whatever you want to do. But yeah, share the show. Get some more people involved. We've got a great group of listeners right now, but we're always trying to look to expand that audience, kind of get to the next level. So spread the word, folks. Enter the contest. Take our money. Yes. One last thing I wanted to mention, uh, I'm the editor for a literary journal, the Manzano Mountain Review, and we just, well, as of the recording, we put out our second issue. By the time you're hearing this, that issue has been out for a while, but I would love for you to uh, go check it out if you are interested in uh, short stories and poems, uh, some not necessarily noir content, but more just general literary fiction. Some of the tastes are mine and some of the tastes are my co-editor, Christian. We really love what what came out of this issue. There was some real good writing and we're really proud to present it and put it out there to the world. It's free to go find online at Manzano, M-A-N-Z-A-N-O, Manzano Mountain Review.com. So go check that out. And uh, if that's your, if that's your cup of tea. Well, I can say as uh, I haven't finished reading everything in episode or uh, issue two of, of the review. And I'm not just saying this because uh, you're on the show with me, Justin, but I've really enjoyed some of the stories I've uh, read in there. There's some good stuff, especially for a brand new journal. And um, I think it's it's only going to grow as far as quality. So check it out in the early stages here, folks, and then you won't have to catch up on as many issues later on. Thanks, Kurt. All right, moving on to our reviews. Uh, It's five round burst where we do five short reviews in about five minutes. And uh, I'm going to do four today and Justin's going to do one. Do you want to start us off uh, with your review, Justin? Yeah, sure. Why don't Why don't we do that? All right. So the book I read for this episode is called Bangkok 8 by John Burdett, a non-practicing lawyer turned writer. And the book was published by Vintage Books in 2003. Bangkok 8 is the first in the series of no- novels set in Thailand and featuring Detective Sanche Jitplicheep, a devout Buddhist detective, and he unravels some pretty complex cases that are international in scope. There's a lot of moving in and out of Thailand, a lot of people, because it's a tourist-heavy economy, coming from Europe, coming from other parts of Asia. So there's a lot of a lot of ground that's covered in this novel. In the case of this book specifically, the crime is murder by snakes, and the victim is a very tall African-American man with ties to the U.S. military. Why was he killed, and by whom? Over the course of 320 pages, Burdett takes us deep into the seedy Bangkok underworld of sex tourism, black market gem dealing, meth peddling, and cops on the take. I enjoyed the setting. Burdett is very good at bringing Thailand's gritty streets to life. I was concerned, however, about Burdett. He's an Anglo ex-lawyer. He doesn't live in Thailand. He's from Britain and has lived in Hong Kong. I was wondering if he would be the best tour guide for Thailand. But I admit that, at least from my perspective as a non-Thai white guy, that I feel like the Thai characters are reasonably well-developed and are not presented as caricatures. It seems that he did his best to make complex human beings. But I would be a little more comfortable if this book had been written by somebody who was on the ground, uh, Thai, grew up in the culture, and understands it more intimately. I just, you know, these types of situations make me a little suspect. That being said, the main problem I had with this book is that Burdett left little to the imagination. It was so detailed, so 
I would I almost want to say overwritten. I feel like maybe it's part of his lawyer past or his desire to prove his commitment to capturing an authentic Thailand, but everything was described in such detail, every conversation so meticulously rendered, that I was left yearning for less. The best crime writing to me, as we'll learn as we talk about Dashiell Hammett again, is saying the things that need to be said and letting the reader do the rest. That said, this was the first book in Burdett's Thailand series. I think there are three or four of them now. So here's to hoping that in subsequent novels, he doesn't let words get in the way of a good story. I'll call it a hit, but not a deadly one. You know, my first one uh, for this episode is A Negro in an Ofe by Danny Gardner. And this came out in 2017 from Down and Out Books. And I really enjoyed this just right off the bat. It follows uh, Elliot Caprice, who's a, a both a veteran of World War II and a disgraced uh, Chicago police officer. And he's he's a mixed race guy. Uh, this is taking place in 1952 in northern, roughly northern Illinois. But it does span out from that part of the Midwest a little bit. And Elliot wakes up in a jailhouse in St. Louis, which is at the time basically known as a hanging jail for a black man. And he has to call in some favors of old friends to, to get him out of that jail. And they do. And then this brings him back to his hometown where he's been on the run for, not a, on the run from his, his hometown, but just hasn't been in contact with friends and family for several years. And I just have to say that Gardner's handling of the racial dynamics in this book is absolutely awesome. I mean, he he's playing with a lot of dynamics of both what it's like to be a light-skinned black man in the case of Elliot versus a dark-skinned black man as his uncle who raised him. The idea of the rural versus the urban uh, analysis of, of race at this time, as well as a class dynamic when he's going from the small town that he's involved in and in and out of Chicago and stuff like that. Just hits on a lot of different angles there. It's full of interesting characters, and what Elliot basically gets involved in is a kind of convoluted, honestly, uh, plot to get money from a very rich woman to help pay off his father's farm. But to do that, there's there's like this Greek shipping company involved and this family dynamic of who this missing murdered guy that all gets kind of convoluted in the plot. But despite that, Gardner's writing on everything else just elevates this book and keeps it a hit. So I would highly recommend that. And it is going to be the first in a series. So I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing, hearing more of Elliot Caprice and his friends and family uh, from small town in Illinois. Next up, I had The Long-Legged Fly by James Salas. This came out in 1992 from Walker and Company. This is the first in the Lou Griffin series. and I guess this is one of those series, like if you know about it, you really love it, or that that seems to be the, the idea I'm getting from people online. But if you've never heard of it, it's not well known pu publicly, and it's actually somewhat hard to get a hold of these these books in this series. Salas is probably best known for the book Drive, which was made into a movie a couple of years ago. But this takes place in New Orleans underbelly, and um, it follows, of course, Lou Griffin, his life, and it's broken up into several sections. And unlike so many of the crime novels that we look at, it's broken up into different periods of his life. It starts out in his early life, slightly after being a police officer, when he starts being a private detective. And each section of the book, there is an element of he's either trying to find somebody or do the normal things that a private detective does, but then it turns also into a personal story and it ends late in his life uh, with a with a personal tragedy. And I don't want to give too much away because it's essentially five or six short stories. And man, I just I like this. I like this type of writing. It's very similar to me to Ken Bruins. Uh, writing with Jack Taylor, where it's poetic and it evokes a lot of mood. I mean, it's it's both hard-boiled and poetic, and that's probably the best thing I can say to encourage you to look at uh, Salas's writing. But these Lou Griffin series, I'm looking forward to number two. This one is a hit, highly recommended. Number three is Right as Rain by George Pelicanos. This came out in 2001 by Back Bay Books. And Pelicanos is probably best known as the one of the writer producers of the television show The Wire, as, as well as several others after that. But this is the first Derek Strange novel. Uh, we have another African American PI, this time in DC. And he gets involved in an investigation where a white cop who was on duty by the name of Terry Quinn shoots a black cop who's off duty in plain clothes by the name of Chris Wilson. 
And the investigation into this is not very well handled by the D.C. Police Department. And Chris Wilson's mother hires Derek Strange to investigate the shooting and basically try to find out why her son was killed. He was holding a gun at the time. Why did Terry Quinn shoot him? Really, the reveals in this, again, I don't want to get too much into what what happens here, but Quinn is fairly quickly found to not really, I mean, he did, yes, he did the shooting, but there's other circumstances involved in what happens here. And this investigation leads to drug runners. There's a search for a missing woman who is the sister of Chris Wilson, Sandra Wilson. And ultimately, that's kind of where the plot goes, is this, this search for what happened to Sandra Wilson. I would say this is a hit, but I'm hesitant to say that because in a way, the discussions that happen in here with this police shooting, with uh, the, the racial dynamics in D.C., it feels dated. In 2001, maybe this would have been more hard hitting for certain readers, maybe not so much for others. But based on this, this came out before shows like The Wire, before our current political discussions about police shootings and this sort of thing. So it, it does have that dated feel to it. And unfortunately, I'm not sure that the overall narrative propels it above that dated political analysis. The last book for today is Aldolfo Kaminsky, A Forger's Life, which came out in 2016 from Doppelhaus Press. It's written by Sarah Kaminsky, his his daughter, but it's told from Aldolfo's point of view. And this is a real life, a true tale of a forger in France, in Europe, who starts out as a forger with fake documents as part of the French resistance and fighting Nazis and getting people travel documents, passports, you know, any of that kind of thing to move underground during Nazi occupation. And what continues from this is his story of how, unlike many members of the French resistance who after the war just resumed their normal lives, he continued to be a forger until quite late in his life. And he would continue to forge for basically for social justice movements around the world, including the Algerian independence movement. He did a lot of stuff with helping Jews who were stuck in Europe uh, after World War II get documents that would allow them to travel to Israel. He provided training and documents to people who were resisting the fascist regime of Franco in Spain. I mean, just he never really goes for probably very good reason, never really goes into all of the people that he helped. But he helped with many independence movements across Africa, Asia, South America. He was a go to guy for documents if if you were in one of these organizations at the time. And he in this book, he does claim that he never used his ability to forge for personal gain. And he always would try, if he found out a group he was working with was using very violent means, he would distance himself from those organizations. So one of the things is basically was to be able to give people free movement around the world. And so many of these real life crime books are focused on, you know, burglars or what have you. And that's interesting. But here's a guy who was using these illicit skills and living an underground life to make the world a better place. And I found this to be a really good book. It does leave maybe more questions than answers in certain parts, but that's, I think that's par for the course with a book of this type. But if you're interested in that sort of thing, I would highly recommend uh, A Forger's Life. All right, folks. So we have a, a new segment this episode called The Featured Review. A Featured Review is a book we received from a publisher or an author for review considerations. Now, that doesn't mean we're obligated to like it or review it. Uh, oftentimes, we may not. However, if we do like or really love a book, we definitely will review it. And in this case, we both love the, the book that we're going to be reading or discussing today. If you are a publisher or an author who wants to see their work considered for review uh, on Point Blank, send us a note. An email works best at pointblanknoir at gmail.com. That would be the best way. This episode, we're going to be discussing a book by Bob Hartley titled North and Central. This book came out in 2017 and was published by Tortoise Books. Okay, so this is a gritty crime novel, and it's Hartley's second. I haven't read his first, but I put it on my uh, to-read list. This is set in working-class Chicago in the late 1970s. I'm from Chicago, so this book is close to my heart. It reminds me of a time that's, that's long gone. This is an era before Mike Ditka and the Bears winning their first and only Super Bowl, before Michael Jordan and the Bulls, before Millennium Park and the iconic bean sculpture, before bike-friendly Mayor Daley Jr. and Obama and Rahm, 
This was an end of an era of manufacturing and industry, and in this novel, one of the major employers, Zenith Corporation, is about to go under. The main character is Andy, a bar owner with a terminal illness. He is surrounded by a motley crew of drunks, miscreants, ex-drug addict, younger brothers of ex-girlfriends, old friends, crooked cops, old friends who are crooked cops. This was a fun, well-written crime novel. What did you think about it, Kurt? I really, I love this. I thought it was great. I mean, I, I don't say that lightly in this case. I, For me, it, it, it just, it is gritty Rust Belt crime fiction. And even though I didn't grow up in Chicago, I'm definitely a Midwesterner. And there's a lot of it that still speaks to me as far as that, that industrial nature of certain things, the bar culture, it feels right. And not only that, this is a great story. I think Hartley did a nice thing with the main character, Andy, in kind of changing up uh, what some of his motivations for doing the crime were from what, you know, sometimes we get as a standard, some standard ideas. I thought that was, I mean, I really, I just like this. No, I'm with you. I thought the from page one, we we're introduced to a character, a setting, and an atmosphere that that's raw, that's really present. I really felt like I was in that bar. I mean, most of the story is set in a bar. Andy owns a bar. He works there. We get this cast of characters, these bar flies. I feel like it could be a Bukowski novel if it was written differently and the subject matter was different. But that feeling, that gritty, despairing quality, which is very noirish, it felt right. But it's it's also, it's cold. It's winter in Chicago. The bleakness. I, I mean, I can just picture the gray skies and that bone chilling cold. I really liked uh, the dynamic between the main character and I guess you could say his, the antagonist, which is his friend, Jerry, who happens to be a cop and also the husband of Andy's long lost love. It becomes really, I mean, it becomes a love triangle, but also it becomes almost like a family. There's a family drama that's at the core. It's what really makes this story tick. It's not just a bunch of CD characters fucking up. It's about Andy, his past, what he wants out of his future, the difficulties he'll face uh, achieving any future, given that he has an illness that's starting to creep up and debilitate him. And he's aware of it, but nobody else knows. And, you know, what? what's going to become of him? He has a yearning and is very clearly laid out, but it doesn't fall into melodramatic nonsense. Uh, the book stays taut and mean. And when the criminal activity starts to pick up, when Andy goes in on a deal and then there's another deal, the suspense gets ratcheted up and things start to unravel and things get rough and rougher. There's not a ounce of, of writing wasted in this book. It says exactly what it needs to say and it, and it ends in a moment uh, of, I don't know, I wouldn't say heartbreak, but the ending is a wow moment. Let's put it that way. There's so many elements of this that could have come out as cliche or boring and Hartley didn't didn't fall into those traps at all you know who cares about another book about a bunch of characters in a bar if you do it wrong this is done right and it's compelling and all I felt like all the characters were compelling to listen to you know to just hear their backstory and, and invoke that that mood and in some ways this could be even those two different locations this could be a more modern tale from the same bar that we saw in shoot the piano player uh inherit you know like a modern harriet's and i say that as a as a great compliment, all the motivations for the characters felt realistic. And, you know, sometimes there's, there's a lot of conceits made in crime fiction to just force it into the, into the narrative. And, the, and this makes sense. And I, again, I can't go back to how much of this captures that to me, a real feel of a gritty rust belt bar. It made me think of now this is going to sound wrong, but I didn't <laughs> spent a fair amount of time in a bar as a child in small town uh, Wisconsin and not a lot of time but we used to go after my dad's softball games and you just hang out that's what you did now that's not the same as this bar in this book but a lot of the types of characters who were sitting around the bar a lot of the types of interactions that happen when you get the same people in that space it felt right to me I mean I think this actually is good enough to say that this fits into classic Chicago fiction at this point. I mean, I, I think it was that good. I'm okay with that. I mean, and we haven't really spent too much time discussing Chicago noir, Chicago hard-boiled. It's something that we will come around to as we get out of the, the 12 classic episodes cycle we've been in. But this is up there. This is worthy of, of a, a main topic 
review. And I really think that he hardly nailed Chicago. And it's not just the, the characters and the love triangle. It's these these barflies who he tries to give three dimensionality to uh, the skeleton couple, like just, just emaciated couple, a gin and tonic doc. Like we get into a little, uh, just enough backstory for each of these characters so that, that we yearn for them or we feel something for them. We understand where their pain comes from or what they're, what they're fleeing. They're not just cardboard cutouts sitting at the bar. So uh, there are a couple other things that were interesting in this book, but we don't want to spend too much time on it. We want, and we don't want to reveal too much because uh, we want you to go out there and uh, buy this book and, and give it a good read. North and Central by Bob Hartley. Highly recommended by both of us. Yeah, give it a read. It's it's available as a ebook. It's available on Kindle Unlimited if you do that kind of thing. Um, I can't say much more than read this book. Cool. All right, moving on to Subject Unknown. Subject, Subject Unknown. unknown. This time on Subject Unknown, we are going to look at a lost, quote unquote, I'm doing the air quotes, Justin, so you can see them. Yes. A lost piece of Hammett fiction. This is The Glass That Laughed. It was originally published in 1925, and apparently nobody really knew that this was a Hammett piece of fiction until it was discovered. I'm not actually sure who it was discovered by because there's a whole chain of online connections that led to eventually... Hammett's granddaughter getting a hold of it and that's how it, it got its uh, larger notoriety here that this thing was no longer lost and it was published like I said in 1925 in True Police Stories and this was a very small very short-lived magazine published by a police organization out of New York it was basically around for three years and somebody found an old copy of it and they saw old Dash's name there and they said, hey, look at this. Does anybody know about the glass that laughed? So here is this lost tale, newly rediscovered. And what did you think of this thing, Justin? I think there's a good reason it got lost. Yes, I would I would agree with you. And what is this uh, very short story? Because it, it really is of what, like a couple of pages long? Yeah, yeah, it's very short. It's, yeah, I would call it a piece of flash fiction, essentially. Yeah. It starts with the line... Here's the first line. Moonlight, slanting through the window, became a white pattern on the floor of the room in which Norman Backer awakened. Norman Backer is our protagonist, our main character, and he wakes up and looks in the mirror. And the mirror scares the shit out of him because he doesn't see his own face. He sees the face of his brother. Yep. And that's that's essentially the story in the nutshell because things didn't go very well between him and his brother. This has a very haunted quality, a little bit of Poe. It should be a, a long lost story by Cornell Woolrich. It has that brooding, heavy, horror-like psychological thing going on that I, I was surprised, frankly, that this was a Hammett story. Yeah, I guess today we might say that this is a story that feels like he phoned it in. Yeah, this was a quick paycheck from the the police association over there at uh, True Police Stories, whatever. Yeah. What can we say about this? It's it's really, I mean, I don't know. I, I really don't have anything good to say about it because it's so basic. I mean, this sort of reads like something you might, this might be a story you would receive in a college creative fiction writing class 101 or something. If you said, hey, give me something inspired by Woolrich or Poe or, or somebody like that, they might turn a piece like this into you. Yeah, if if this was submitted to the Manzano Mountain Review, I would have rejected it as being cliche and boring. I mean, it doesn't go anywhere. And as we know, I'm not a big fan of the brooding melodrama that Cornell Woolrich introduced me to in, in the book we reviewed uh, in episode nine. The Night Has a Thousand Eyes. That book drove me fucking crazy. And this story reminded me of it. This is a very minor work. Obviously, he's just trying to get paid, I think. Playing around. It feels like a first draft. Uh, it doesn't really go anywhere. doesn't have his sharp prose. It's more, uh, almost more of a meditation and a channeling of Poe and an experiment. And I guess I give him credit for experimenting, for playing with themes that Dostoevsky plays with and some of the other more psychological novelists. When we decided to read this for Subject Unknown, I figured it was going to be some long-lost continental op classic 
detective detecting story, but it's just not that. Dashiell Hammett, he didn't hit it out of the park every time. In his novels, in his short stories, he has some hits, he has some misses. This was a miss, and uh, it was lost, and now it's found, and now we can lose it again. So let's let's talk just about that concept a little bit here, because, you know, any Hammett, obviously a big name writer, and any time you get a writer of this renowned, there seems to be always a desperate hunt for every scrap of paper they ever jotted a note down on. I, at this point, don't care about lost works by anybody who in the modern era, because there's probably a reason why those works are lost. And they either didn't get published because they weren't good or they, you know, just weren't saved. The writer didn't want to save them, what have you. And what originally turned me off to these sorts of things is is way back when, if people are fans of fantasy fiction, Christopher Tolkien started producing all of these new Middle Earth books based on the notes of his father. Well, somehow those notes ended up being like, I don't know, 15 more books. And frankly, I, I find that ridiculous. But we see that with, you know, many big name authors. Now, if we if we found a lost work of Shakespeare or a Greek tragedy or something of that caliber, yeah, I'm going to be interested in that. But when you're submitting this stuff uh, to be published like this, like if it wasn't saved in an archive, if the author didn't have it, you know, tucked away as like, hey, this is something I I might want to publish, then there's probably a good reason why it's 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 lost. Good point. And uh, it's gotten to the point where uh, if I see that the lost work of something, I'm probably going to run away. That said, I do find an appeal of something where they believe the piece of fiction was not published due to, say, censorship or, uh, you know, purity type law kind of stuff. In that case, I found a couple of things that were pretty good, including one by Earl Stanley Gardner, which, I mean, he wrote so much stuff. This one was just like, I don't think this is going to get past the censors. And by the time the editor had written that note, Gardner probably had two more novels ready for him. So, but anyway, otherwise I'm going to run away. Let's run away together and move on to a book that was much better, indeed. Uh, much better developed, uh, a classic uh, of the genre, one of the first and uh, the featured book of the second part of this two-part episode on Dashiell Hammett's The Maltese Falcon. Yes, The Maltese Falcon. You know, I really think all of our listeners should, if you haven't read this or it's been a while since you've read this one, give it another read. But this is a weird book, at least for me, to review because I feel like it's a must read for the genre and you sh really should give it a give it that that once over. However, and that's what I did. I read this years and years ago. I don't remember how long ago and rereading this now with a different eye. I am not as taken with it as I was initially. I mean, that said, I mean, this for me, this is a four out of five book. There's a lot of stuff in here that's really good, but other parts I don't want to say I disliked, but I would have liked to seen something different. And I'm, I'm really struggling here with the, the idea that so many of our listeners are going to say, well, how can you not like the Maltese Falcon? And I do. I just don't love it. Well, we're not here to fucking get along with every one of our listeners. This is a discussion and we're all free beings in the universe. And I'm going to admit that I was not as impressed with the Maltese Falcon as I am with other books. It gets historic standing. It gets a strong rating from me. I'm going to give it four and a half stars now, or four and a half kill shots. I gave The Big Sleep, which in some ways is a more convoluted, confusing, maybe less well-constructed work, and one that was clearly modeled off of The Maltese Falcon. But I give The Big Sleep five kill shots and I only give this four and a half and I mean I admit this is a classic work it's probably better written by the big sleep there's something however about Sam Spade that I don't like it might be that we don't know what he's thinking the fact that this is written in third person objective we never get inside his mind I find him less relatable than Philip Marlowe it might be something in the plotting or something else that I haven't been able to put my finger on but that's okay I, I like this I like not loving a classic piece of fiction and one of the foundational texts of this podcast. I'm deeply curious to see what specific things you, Kurt, don't love about it and the kind of things that you do love about it in the subsequent part to this episode, because 
because I still haven't quite figured it out. I've taken some notes on it. I've read it a couple of times and it's just not 100% clear to me what what the missing ingredient is. It's interesting. I'm I'm perplexed. Yeah, I I think that sums my my feelings up as well is is perplexed because it does feel like there's something missing. I can't put my finger on it either. And maybe we can do that a little bit in our discussion uh, next episode. So join us next episode for our full discussion of the Maltese Falcon, and we will try to put our fingers on it, whatever that might be. But before we go for part one, Justin, I want to know, do you believe that the Millennium Falcon is named after the Maltese Falcon? Huh. Now you- That's a good question. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised, but I haven't been recently very well read in the Star Wars literature. So uh, I'm sure there's some tale- some telling of Lucas using, you know, in all of his inspirations, his Kurosawa's and his old Buck Rogers, all that old shit that he used is is inspiration for Star Wars. I wouldn't be surprised if Bogart's The Maltese Falcon, the movie version, snuck in there and uh, became inspiration for the name of his iconic spaceship. Well, the real answer is that nobody actually knows or is admitting to it because I mm-hmm. looked this up online. Let's remember when we discussed the Hammett work Red Harvest that Blue Harvest was a code name for the filming of the original Star Wars. So we already have a Hammett link and Bogart was considered inspiration for the Han Solo character. So that's interesting. Yeah. Yes. And, and also Lucas, his founding is in San Francisco. He lives in Marin County, just north of San Francisco. So that is his city. That is true. So next time on the show, we'll get into the meat of our discussion on the Maltese Falcon. We'll also talk a little bit about the cultural legacy of the Maltese Falcon and the other work of Dashiell Hammett. Anything before we go, Justin? We will also uh, dive into the purpose of that whole footcraft parable uh, in the book. What's the meaning behind that? What was Hammett's goal in introducing to us the story of footcraft and his life-changing events that prompted him to leave his family? And if you don't know what I'm talking about, then that means you haven't read The Maltese Falcon yet, and you should go do that before the next episode releases. Yes, and in the meantime, watch out for falling beams. Yes. And after uh, The Maltese Falcon, we will be discussing Queen Pin by Megan Abbott, who has the distinction of being the first author that we're going to discuss who is still alive. So. Yeah, <laughs> honestly, seriously, wow. <laughs> yeah. They're all dead. Well, let, let's hope that Meg and Abbott does not die between now and when this episode gets released in a couple months. May you have many more good years, Meg and Abbott. Yes. Cheers, Megan. <laughs> Thanks for joining us uh, this time on Point Blank. We will see you soon with part two. I'm going to go watch some birds made on some wires. So we'll see you all next time, folks. Point Blank is under a Creative Commons license. Music is by Justin. Copywritten works are property of their respective corpus.